Hello and welcome back. Okay, today's video is on the critical path. Now there's not a great deal left to do on the CPU itself at the center. I'm mostly working on the peripherals either side of it. But the critical path is something that I think it's worth us spending a little bit of time on before we call the central CPU fully done. Now, when I refer to that term, what I'm referring to is the path of signals through the system which takes the longest and ends up defining the maximum clock rate we can achieve. Let me explain more. Okay, so I've zoomed the camera into just the core CPU. Right, down here in the bottom right is the clock module, and that generates the square wave clock that drives everything. Now, the vast majority of digital CPU circuits run off a clock, which is kind of like a heartbeat, and that synchronizes all of the modules. So each time the clock pulses, a chain of events starts off in all the different sub-circuits which actually perform the functions of the processor. Now this one's currently clocked at 4 MHz. Now that's much faster than I ever expected to get this circuit running at, but I'm curious to know why 4 MHz is about as fast as it can go. I could get it slightly quicker than that, but it wasn't very stable. So something in here takes a fixed amount of time, which can't quite fit into either half or a full clock cycle. Now the reason why I say that is the clock is a square wave. There is a half of the duty cycle where the signal's high. It's the first half of the clock and half where it's low. And there are kind of three possibilities for signal timing. You've got signals that must happen in the first half, signals that must happen in the second half, and signals that are triggered by the start of the clock and just need to finish inside the whole clock pulse. The organization of our circuit is also pipelined, so a lot of things happen in this order between the fetch unit, which is pipeline stage 0, stage 1, and stage 2. So I think it would be wise for us to consider the timings of the circuit like that. But let's um, fire up the circuit, get the oscilloscope running, and start to look at some of the timing. Okay, so the program I've got running here and blown onto this ROM is a modified version of the sieve of Eratosthenes code. So it's going to constantly loop around finding all the prime numbers in the range of 0 to 65,535. So I can slow that right down and we can see the program kind of running its way through the entire system. Let's fire up the oscilloscope and actually take a look at what's going on here though. Now there should be a clock signal to pick up there. And yes, we see from the scope it's four megahertz. And that's our approximate square wave of the clock signal. So at four megahertz, one complete cycle of that should be 250 nanoseconds. So each half of that is 125 nanoseconds. And we've got work that needs to be done in each half in some modules and across the whole clock in others. So we kind of need to work out a way of looking at the timing. And I think a good place to look first is perhaps the ALU. Now the ALU has the diode matrix here, which controls the actual operation going on. And that operation is selected by four bits here as the ALU op, right next to where I've grabbed the clock. Now, if I look at any old random bit of the ALU op, we should get a vague idea of when it changes. Okay, so I can adjust the cursor line here and see roughly when that change aligns with the consistent place the ALU operation line seems to be changing. And we can see that relative to the start of that clock cycle, that's about 28 nanoseconds in. Okay, so in both of the operational pipeline stages, the outputs are driven by these 574D types. Now, stage one is where we set the ALU up. So at the very start of the clock cycle, these flip-flop latches are triggered to take the inputs that have been preloaded as the outputs from the ROM chip and put them onto the output lines. And they go directly to the ALU control unit. So that's these four bits here. That 28 nanoseconds is not only the first point where we believe the ALU has got its command, but it's probably actually 
where the output lines first change for all of these lines coming out of the two pipeline stages, because they're the same chip that's driving those outputs. Actually, the rest of the ALU is driven off an ALU clock, which is the clock signal that's modified to only happen when the ALU operation is non-zero. So we can probably take a look at that over here and see, yes, indeed, it, uh, it looks like a just slightly delayed copy of the clock for the most part. But obviously, we see a solid line above it because a lot of cycles, there's no ALU op. So it's a constant line. Now the AVA inputs to the ALU are the values on the LHS and RHS bus, which come from the registers. So let's look at when they change. We're going to look at the bottom bit of LHS. Okay, this is very interesting. We see this um, selection of change points at about the midpoint of the first half of the clock. And that is going to be the first point that the registers start asserting to the bus. But then we see much later in the clock cycle a place where there are lots of changes. And that is going to be situations in which the register is loaded as a result of the previously executing instruction. Now I'm going to be honest, I was expecting that to be sooner and that's kind of interesting because if we were running a much slower clock cycle it would be much sooner. But it's happening very late in the day. So the first half of the ALU operation actually only has kind of just under a quarter of the cycle to happen in. Let's see when RHS changes. Pretty much the same, although it looks like that's less frequently a late change. Okay, so let's look at the assert line. Okay, that's not actually involved in this, but that's comparatively early. So this is LHS assert. That happens quite early in the cycle. RHS assert I'm expecting is very similar. Now let's look at the load line. Okay, this is interesting. The load line, that rising edge is quite a bit later than I was expecting it to be. But that is being pushed back by the delay we added in the bus control. Okay, now the thing with this is we delayed the start of these signals inside bus control. So we didn't have a race condition with the, the messages coming across from the pipeline stages. But that means the rising edge is pushed back by just as much as the delayed start. And while, while obviously we knew that was going to happen, when I initially put that delay in, I was thinking about a kind of 1, 1 1.5 megahertz clock. And now at 4 megahertz, we see that's actually pushed back by quite a significant margin. I need to give that some thought because maybe there's something we can improve about that, if not in this design, but in future designs where we use similar techniques. Okay, so that's 206 nanoseconds. So that's pretty late in our 250 nanosecond clock cycle. I wouldn't be surprised if just by that we've discovered one of the big constraints on the clock rate. But that's the inputs to the ALU covered. Let's talk about the outputs. Obviously the biggest and most significant output of the ALU is the actual value that comes out of here. Now it's very difficult to actually detect the signals going onto the main bus because if I stick a contact there it's just going to be seeing whatever's actually on the main bus. But perhaps I can just say look at a signal on one of the LEDs to see it immediately behind the line driver. So that's coming in at about 53 nanoseconds. In some ways we're majorly saved here by the fact that the ALU is actually very simple. We've got the two input stages which have quite a short duration at that, the end of the previous cycle to do their work. But then these two stages of the ALU are very simple. There's only one layer of logic chips in the way of the input. 
then in the second cycle they get clocked into the result element and that's got the result settled by this 53 nanoseconds into the next cycle. I am interested by this though because the, um, the ALU is obviously capable of running a lot faster than it currently is. It's being um, held back by the rest of the system, but that's good. That's a circuit that we don't need to worry about too much. But the other output from the ALU though is the flags. Now some of the flags are derived from the output, so potentially will take slightly longer, so we need to look closely at those. Now one reason why these flags are extremely important is they form some of the inputs to the pipeline ROM chips. Now the pipeline ROM chips produce the outputs that go to the latches that we looked at in the very first step, but these outputs will take up to 150 nanoseconds because these ROMs have a 150 nanosecond access time. And so we're very interested in all of the inputs that are actually going to drive them. Now, the reset signal is an input that's almost irrelevant to the timing because it only happens at uh, the, the very startup. We've got a few bits of signal exchange between the pipeline stages, but the main inputs to those address lines on the ROMs are the instruction and the flags. So let's look at those flags because we know the instruction in pipeline stage two is immediately clocked in at the start of the cycle. In pipeline stage one, it's slightly more complex because the inputs to the ROM are set from the fetch unit, but we'll look at that later on. So the flags are along these inputs. That's a ground line and it's overflow. Very difficult to see where it's changing relative to the other signals. Let's try switching the trigger up. Now it looks like the overflow flag will often pulse partially, which is probably just the logic that calculates its settling. And we need to measure that relative to the start of the clock cycle. So it looks a little bit erratic. This is probably one of those signals where the actual exact time to settle is very dependent on the actual numbers inside the registers. So what we're looking at there is around about 91 nanoseconds. All right, next flag, that's the sign bit. That actually looks pretty similar, also around about the 91 nanoseconds. Then we've got the zero flag, that's purely derived from the outputs. Ah, a bit more logic on that one. Okay, so that's interesting, 112 nanoseconds. It's arithmetic carry, 88. Logical carry. This is actually generated in the first cycle. That's only 34. And actually, while we're here, we'll take a quick look at the PCRA flip-flop, because that's treated as a flag. It's around about 33. Okay, so the big surprise there was the zero flag. Now, I do have a couple of layers of logic in there to create that because we're basically just trying to gnaw all the bits of the output together. But instead of one big gnaw gate, I've had to kind of cascade a few gates together so there's a bit of depth to it. And I think definitely looking at a slightly faster way of doing that in future might be a good idea. The overflow flag wasn't quite that slow, but that also had a couple of layers of logic, but it's definitely the zero flag needs attention. Everything else was settled a lot quicker, so our maximum speed out of the ALU could be improved if we sped up the zero flag calculation. Now the big surprise is of course that the zero flag is actually changing later in the cycle than we should be able to handle. So I think it would be worth us looking purely at the inputs to the pipeline. So in pipeline stage two, the other inputs are the output from pipeline stage one. And my suspicion is that's not gonna be anything like as far as the 112 nanoseconds. So we can probably discount it from consideration. Yes, that's 36 nanoseconds. And pipeline stage one, it's slightly more complex because we've got the fetch unit in front of it, so it might take slightly longer. 
Yeah, that's much more erratic. Oh wow, so that's all the way up to 142 nanoseconds, it looks, maybe even slightly more. Right, we are definitely breaking the rules on these ROM chips, so we're probably actually overclocking this circuit slightly at 4 megahertz. That probably shouldn't be too big a surprise to us because a lot of parts will run slightly quicker than their um, allocated times. And the 150 nanoseconds here is going to be the kind of guaranteed time. Let's see if we can actually find out how long this is taking though. Okay, so for, for the most part, the output from the ROM chips is settling very early in the cycle. And then we're occasionally seeing these lines pop around later, which is probably just the very rare occasions when some of those slower flags are having an impact. So the reason why we're successfully overclocking this processor is purely because these ROM chips appear to be a lot quicker than their specifications. Now, a lot of the inputs to pipeline stage one are the same as pipeline stage two, apart from we've got the fetched instruction here. So let's look at what the net result there is. All right, okay, so that's much later. So I'm seeing about 234. Okay, so that's definitely on the critical path there. What's interesting is pipeline stage two, the slowest of its inputs is the flags from the ALU, but pipeline stage one is taking longer than that. So the only thing that uh, is rationally an explanation for that is going to be the instruction coming in from the fetch unit. So let's take a look at that. Okay, I'm seeing some very distinct bands here. So these ones at the start are probably going to be the dispatched operations that were held in the latch chip. They come in quite quick at 43 nanoseconds. We seem to get an awful lot coming in at about 108, but then we see occasional flickers coming in all the way up to about 150 here. And the only real explanation I've got for that is the time for fetch. Let's think about what's happening for fetch. It's like we've got the extra logic we added to hold back instructions that trigger a clash between the two pipeline stages here. So that's when we get an immediate load and a memory access. So we have to hold the uh, immediate load back a cycle. So that's that quick dispatch. Other than that, the bulk of it is going to be the memory read. The inputs here is literally just the memory data bus. So we're going to see fetch, memory read, and memory write if we look at that. Memory writes are direct asserts off the GPRs. They're actually going to happen really quickly because none of the delayed actions from the ALU is going to be a problem there because we've got no instructions that output to memory direct from the ALU. We can only source it from any of these registers and all of those are just a simple line drivers from the internal latches. So that's going to be quick. So reads are down to the speed of the memory access. So the slowest thing we see on a read will be either a fetch or a memory read, which should be the same because the same process of writing an address register to the address bus and pulling the data out is what's happening. So we just need to look at these lines. It's as good a place as any to look. Okay, so that's about what, 97, be generous, call it 100 nanoseconds. So that means that the rest of the fetch operation is taking around about 50 nanoseconds, but it takes us 100 nanoseconds to get the memory in. Okay, so they are officially 55 nanosecond access time. So we've got to account for 45 nanoseconds. Let's take a look at the address lines. So we've got an assert signal comes from the program counter. That will hit the address lines in the memory unit and it will output data. So see when the data is changing after 100 nanoseconds. See when the address line changes. Okay, so this is interesting. The address line is changing at about 75 nanoseconds after the start of the cycle. But then the data has read by about 100 nanoseconds. So similar to what we had with the ROMs, things seem to be happening quicker than the actual data sheets say. We're getting the data out of these for in about 25 nanoseconds. And those seem to be a little under 100. 
It's, it's good that the data sheets are saying worst case scenario, but um, we have to be careful not to get tripped up by things being faster most of the time than we think they are. But that 75 nanoseconds seems slow. And if you watched my pallet video for the VGA very carefully, you'll actually realize there was a point inside there where I noticed the address signal seemed to be changing later than I expected. And I kind of paused and realized, well, I don't think it's going to affect us negatively here, as long as I keep it in the back of my mind to come back and check later. So now I actually get to investigate that. But it's clear right now that the critical path that we've got is instruction fetch through to pipeline stage one. The ALU doesn't actually take a part because the instruction fetch takes slightly longer than that zero flag. But if we sped this up at all, that zero flag might come into play. Okay, so the second from a bottom is assert address. It's about 42 milliseconds. It's interesting. That's further into the cycle than I was expecting, but that's not enough to account for the change of the data lines. I need a better way of hooking into the address. Okay, so I've set my main trigger up to be a change on the address lines. So let's look at that address assert line now. So we're seeing about a 37-ish nanosecond delay. I thought the line drivers were quicker than that. Okay, that's interesting. So the copy operation happens about 20 nanosecond before. And then the assert happens at 38. Look at those relative to the clock again. Right, so assert command gets to the address register about 45 nanoseconds in. Then the change to the address bus happens about 75, 76 nanoseconds in. The copy going to the D-type 574s is happening 58 nanoseconds in, which is why we sometimes see the address slightly quicker, but sometimes it's changing ever so slightly later because the copy is causing these latches to update from the counters. Interesting. Okay, I think we've just about tested everything now. I'm going to shut the oscilloscope down. Okay, so we now have a pretty solid un understanding of the critical path. We've got the goings on in pipeline stage one takes slightly longer than pipeline stage two. So in actual fact, everything up here is kind of irrelevant to us because it's a race. And since pipeline stage two wins, it's not restricting our clock rate. Pipeline stage one is quite a close run thing between the fetch and the zero flag coming from the ALU. So that was 112 nanoseconds there and about 150 nanoseconds for fetch to complete. So if we sped the fetch up by just a few nanoseconds, suddenly we'd start worrying about the ALU. The ALU, we could speed that operation up without changing the ALU at all. If we got the, the load operations of the previous cycle's results or the memory operations or whatever else was changing a GPR, if we got that to happen slightly closer to the midpoint of the cycle, we'd add any nanoseconds that we improve that into the slack at the end of the cycle. But the big surprise was fetch taking up to 150 nanoseconds and then we're relying on these ROMs decoding a bit quicker just to actually uh, have it stable at 4 megahertz. Now the fetch, we've got an issue in bus control where the copy seems to be happening late. And I strongly suspect that relates to the way we stuck the delay on the front. And I will go and have a look at the schematic for that. We've got potentially just over 10 nanoseconds we could gain back from that. 
but it does seem to take a little while just to get the address onto the bus. So we're kind of relying on the fact that the memory chips are very quick here as well. Let's be absolutely specific about the critical path here. Pipeline stage two, that sends out the address register selection. And whenever it's not accessing memory, it sends out the current program counter, which will be one of these two. That gets sent out from the address select lines. That goes to bus control. Bus control generates a address bus select line to one of these two registers, whichever one's currently working as the program counter. And that pushes the current program counter address onto the address bus. Memory issues the instruction to the bottom of the fetch unit. The fetch unit does a little bit of logic with that, passes that into the bottom of pipeline stage one in order for these ROMs to perform a lookup and latch the outputs ready for execution um, at the next clock cycle. And that's the critical path. And what's curious here is if we add that all together, we're actually seeing a number that's higher than the 250 nanoseconds it stably executes in. Because because these RAM chips and these ROM chips seem to be operating slightly quicker than their specification. So we probably shouldn't really be running at four megahertz. We're probably closer to three megahertz if we were to run all of these chips in, in their spec. Although I'm happy to have it running at four, but I'm not gonna try and clock it any faster now I know that. We could improve the speed of these chips. Now there are other ROM technologies out there that, uh, that drop down to about 55 nanoseconds, which is faster than these ones are working. So that would cut down a lot of time from it. We could get faster RAM chips here, but actually if we improved the output stage here and we got that copy, the delay on the copy line reduced, that would probably uh, get us the, the fetch happening a bit quicker. But yeah, I mean, this is, this is really interesting. We've identified a few places we could improve things, but if we improve the fetch speed, we're gonna bump into the ALU. So it's not like we've got one thing here that's um, causing everything to slow down a lot. We know faster pipeline ROMs would improve the clock rate, but just sticking faster parts in to do the same thing is, uh, is kind of less interesting than evaluating the circuit as a whole. Okay, now this was really interesting. We've gone all the way through the build and traced the critical path from the pipeline stage two through to the memory access for the fetch, the fetch processing, and then into pipeline stage one to generate its control signals. Now, we wouldn't have to change that circuitry very much to move the critical path across to the ALU. So there's a few other bits of the circuitry we can look at. I don't think there's any reason to make any significant changes to the circuit as it stands. I'm actually very, very pleased with the fact that we got this all the way up to four megahertz, but there's definitely a couple of th things that we can stick in the back of our minds to think about for possible future circuit designs. And overall, this is an outstanding learning experience. As always, thanks a lot to my patrons. I really appreciate your support. And everyone, I really hope you found this interesting. It was actually very rewarding for me. See you again soon. Thanks for watching. Goodbye.